Good morning, YouTubers. You have reached the Brian Sledge channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye. But before that, I want to talk briefly, and I hope conservatives, liberals, everything in between, or whatever, will listen to me when I speak to this. And that is the right to bear arms. I've done in the last, oh, period of time, I guess, an enormous amount of research on this subject. Now, generally speaking, do you know why there's a Second Amendment? Does anybody know why there's a Second Amendment? Is it for hunters? Is it for target shooters? Is it even to protect yourself? Do you know why there's a Second Amendment? And the right for individuals to bear arms? I'm going to tell you why it's there. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, It was to make sure that the population was armed in order to overthrow a tyrannical government. Now that's the truth. That shouldn't scare people. That shouldn't scare people at all. Because when you consider today how responsible 99.9% of gun owners are, That 99.999% of gun owners have no intention of using their weapons to overthrow the government. And it puts things in a bit of a better context, don't you think, Mr. Producer? That's the reason why there is a Second Amendment, and that part of the Second Amendment goes all the way back through British history. There's a citizens rising up against the monarchy rising up against the Parliament and Oliver Cromwell, and on and on and on. A history that we've lost today, but that the framers were well aware of. That the delegates to the state ratifying conventions, at the constitutional conventions, were aware of. That's why they insisted on a Bill of Rights. When you look at the Bill of Rights, The Bill of Rights exists, including the Second Amendment, to protect the individual from the federal government. Not to protect sports and hunters. Not to protect poets under the First Amendment. But to protect us, all of us. So the Second Amendment had as its purpose, not hunting, not sports shooting, not target shooting, Not just individual self-defense, but defense against a tyrannical government. It's true. It's true. And when you consider, once again, how responsible 99.9% of the people are who own tens of millions of weapons then maybe this is a perspective that will help us going forward when these politicians keep insisting that they're going to regulate this, regulate that, regulate bullets. When these left-wing journalists and now politicians want to start listing the names of gun owners after forcing people who own weapons legally to register, to provide their names, now they want to turn around and use that against people Now you see how far we have fallen. It's the gun owners in this America who are among the most responsible people in this country. Absolutely so. If the gun owners in this country, your fellow citizens, your family members, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, if they really wanted to unleash hell... They could unleash hell. And no police department could stop them. But they don't. And they don't want to. They love this country. The National Rifle Association is a magnificent organization. If it didn't exist, the Second Amendment would be gone already. 
just like there are organizations protecting the First Amendment or aspects of it. But I wanted to bring this to your attention and really focus in on this, that the purpose of the Second Amendment, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to keep a free people free from a tyrannical central government. Now, when the Constitution was ratified originally, we didn't have a Bill of Rights, as those of you who listen to this program know. There was great debate over this during the Constitutional Convention. George Mason became an anti-federalist, friends with George Washington. And when Mason voted against it, that is, against the Constitution, and raised his objections, among others, was the lack of a Bill of Rights. His relationship with Washington changed. It became very strained. So it was crucial for the ratification of the Constitution to have a Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson, who, as you know, if you listen to the program, was in Paris and was not at the Constitutional Convention. He wanted a Bill of Rights, even though he supported the Constitution. But it was a close call for him originally. Sam Adams and John Adams in Massachusetts fought like hell. Sam Adams opposed the Constitution. John Adams did everything he could to get it ratified in Massachusetts. It almost failed. It was failing in Virginia. It was failing in New York. The home of Hamilton. Virginia, the home of Madison. Originally, it was a close call in Pennsylvania. The home of Benjamin Franklin. So they had to accommodate the anti-federalists. And many of the federalists began to believe, too, we've got to have this Bill of Rights. I'm bringing up the Second Amendment at the top of the show, and I wasn't going to because I keep listening to the news, the propaganda, the dumbing down of America that's going on in this country. I'm scared for the future of this country. I'm worried. There are no quick fixes. I hear some hosts and some people say, be positive, be this, be that. No, be vigilant. Be resolute. This isn't a psychological game. This isn't a game where you put smiley faces and sad faces on, on, uh, on tests for elementary school students. This is reality, and we're facing it. We now have people in the states, we have people in the federal government, we have mayors want to take people's weapons away. Want people to be listed publicly who own weapons. Law-abiding citizens who haven't done anything to anybody. Who are actually following the Constitution. Who are actually following whatever laws they're asked to follow when they purchase a weapon. They haven't harmed anybody. They have no intention of harming anybody. Now they're the enemy. They're the enemy of the statists. They're the enemy of the state. Isn't that interesting? And they're not the only ones when you look at the Bill of Rights. We have an evangelical family. An evangelical Christian family that in 1970 started a hobby store, a hobby shop, to become a very large chain of hobby shops called Hobby Lobby. These are faithful Christians, evangelical Christians. They follow the law, they pay their taxes, they follow God, good people haven't harmed anybody, aren't looking to harm anybody. They've created this business that people enjoy to buy hobbies, you know, to, to, to promote hobbies and so forth. Very healthy, positive contribution to society and various communities. They're under attack by our government because of Obamacare. They're under attack by the federal judiciary. As I speak, they're being fined $1.3 million a day. Because the owners of this business, evangelical Christians, 
while they're willing and have been before any government mandate purchased health care for their employees good health care they refuse to submit to the government's regulation that requires their health care to cover uh, pills and various other devices and so forth that result in uh, aborted fetuses uh, and other and other requirements being compelled and coerced upon them by the Department of HHS, Obamacare, Obama and his administration. They said, look, we can't spend our money to promote a lifestyle, to promote actions that we believe our God has, has told us never, ever to accept. And we have a federal judge who ruled individuals aren't protected under the First Amendment, religious liberty. Businesses aren't protected per se under the First Amendment. Well, then what the hell is? Who is protected under the First Amendment? Do you have to actually start a church? No. The First Amendment protects individuals. Whether they're businessmen and women, whether they're clergy, or whether they're something else. You're not required to conduct yourself in violation of your own faith in order to comply with a federal regulation. That's why we have a First Amendment. That's why we have a First Amendment. Not just for the press. No, it's for us too. Not just for atheists, but for people of faith too. Not just for the Klan and the neo-Nazis to march. No, it's for us too. Isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that the Democrat Party and their politicians, and too many Republicans, reject the Bill of Rights, reject individual liberty, and embrace tyranny. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. As that law professor Georgetown was arguing for, and I discussed it yesterday, we don't need this Constitution. It's so archaic. There are actually evil provisions in there. This is a mentality that is completely alien to our American heritage. Completely alien to our American heritage. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. It's Friday, so I just thought a little uh, history slash constitutional lesson here would be kind of what we need. Let's take a look at the Ninth Amendment. Anybody ever talk about the Ninth Amendment anymore? No. You want to know why? Because your federal politicians don't want you to know about the Ninth Amendment. Because your left-wing, hate-the-Constitution professors don't want you to know about the Ninth Amendment. Most of your history teachers don't want you to know about it, and the media don't want you to know about it. They don't even know what the hell it says. The Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, part of your Bill of Rights, to protect you from your government. And by the way, that's what the Bill of Rights is. It's to protect you from your federal government. It says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. They were putting an exclamation mark behind the specific enumerated powers in the Constitution. Where they said, okay, Congress, these are your powers and no more. Okay, Executive Branch, this is your power and no more. Okay, Judiciary, we're barely even going to talk about you. This is your power. We'll let Congress figure out the rest of it. And that's it. And that's it. Oh, they went on to discuss other things, yes, but very limited and focused. 
Can you imagine them writing a constitution today? Be 40,000 pages long. But that said, this debate over the Bill of Rights, the concern was if we list certain rights in a Bill of Rights, we're concerned. We're concerned, said the Federalists, that some future government will contend that these are only your rights and no more. The Anti-Federalists said, no. There are certain basic rights where we must explicitly state belong to the people and then we'll make it clear that the fact that we're providing this list of rights does not mean there are no others. And so we'll adopt this amendment, which turned out to be the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Meaning your liberties are almost endless, almost without limits, but for state and local laws, but for your own conscience, your own faith, and so forth. They're not promoting anarchy and chaos. They're promoting an order. Local government, state government, and this federal government, which is not to be involved in every aspect of your life. The Ninth Amendment is never, ever discussed. Not by politicians, Republican or Democrat. Almost never in court decisions. So we need to dust it off. We need to talk about it. We need to assert it. Because that Ninth Amendment belongs to you and me. And it's a crucial amendment. I call that the Individual Liberty Amendment. When we come back, I'm not done. I want to tell you about the Tenth Amendment. They can clone the others, but there's only one Mark Levin, and you can call him at 877-381-3811. I've made it clear, and I've said it before, the Bill of Rights is not the Bill of the Bill of Needs. And I hear it said it's being repeated throughout the talk radio world without attribution. Well, welcome to my nightmare. My nightmare, which is this business. Oh, I love it. I love coming behind the microphone. But the backbenchers galore, it's just unbelievable. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. The Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights are intended to effectuate and advance your unalienable rights. Now let's take a quick look at the... Don't worry, we'll get to the other stuff. You know, the other hosts do it all day. I'll get to the other stuff. And I'll give you my unique uh, insight into it. But let us first have a perspective for these things. Now let's take a look at the Tenth Amendment. It's despised too by the left, by the statists, by Obama, by professors everywhere. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. That would be the specific enumerated powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. You see, when the Constitution was ratified, and later these these amendments that became the Bill of Rights, you were a citizen of a state and a citizen of the nation. A citizen of a state and the citizen of a nation. And at our founding, that is the founding of this government, it was often thought to be more important to be a state representative or state senator or governor than a congressman or U.S. senator, and in many respects even president, Because that's 
where most of the governing power rested in the states. Long time ago, obviously. The states and the people of the states. And the people of the states, the citizens of the states, would vote for the kind of government they wanted in the state and in their communities. Federal government really had a very minimal impact on what went on with people in the states. Of course, today it's almost the other way around. Unless you live in a dark blue state like California or Illinois or, or New York or Rhode Island, uh, where they're destroying you as uh, equally as the federal government is. But that for another day. So, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This is called, by me and others, the Federalism Amendment that recognizes state sovereignty. This is the Federalism Amendment. And the reason why federalism is so important is because we're a very diverse nation. We have diverse backgrounds, diverse religious practices. Now, we have a core to us as as an American. That's not my point. My point is one of the reasons why this country has been so stable and not balkanized is because we respect people having different views wanting to be governed differently in other words we're tolerant so in Texas Virginia Florida there's strong support for instance for the death penalty in Massachusetts I'm not speaking of conservatives, I'm speaking of the populations generally. Massachusetts, New York, California, there's not. And depending on how states treat their people, their citizens, if it gets so bad, people can get up and move. Not that you should, I'm saying you can, and you do. So the more oppressive states, they depopulate themselves. The freer states attract more and more Americans within their borders. So people flooding out of New York and going to Florida because of the tax and regulatory environments in both. Or flooding out of California and going to Nevada or, or Texas or what have you. Starting to pour out of Illinois and going to Indiana. Leaving Maryland and D.C. and coming into Virginia. And cut it out. Stay where you are. But that's a whole other story. So mobility is crucial under the Tenth Amendment, under federalism. Diversity. Tolerance. That's what the Tenth Amendment has created. Which is exactly why the statists who seek to centralize authority, concentrate power, impose their will on the whole nation, every one of us, with a single law or a single regulation, despise the Bill of Rights, particularly the Ninth Amendment, particularly the Tenth Amendment. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, we would not be a constitutional republic but for these amendments because Massachusetts and Virginia and New York, three of the biggest states, as well as some of the others, like New Hampshire, We're not prepared to ratify the Constitution unless it was agreed up front that these issues would be addressed in the first Congress of the United States and amendments sent to the states for ratification. That's how important these amendments were. So when we talk about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, this isn't some game. This isn't some superficial debate. This is an assault on your liberty in our constitutional system. When we stand up and talk about a, a hobby company, hobby lobby, that's merely trying to exist and mind its own business, but the iron fist of government insists that they fund abortions, that they fund birth control when they don't want to, then we need to stand up and speak, whether we agree with them or not, and I do, but that's not the point. That's not the point. 
when our government tries to regulate the Internet, the substantive speech that exists on the Internet, the government tries to control our political system, our donations, under the first of our right to free speech. It's attacking you and me. And to hear these reporters on the network radio news at the top of the hour and these governors and these citizens who are uniting to destroy the Bill of Rights one piece at a time. And they're called, and they call themselves progressives as if they're, they're progressing and evolving is contemptible. Absolutely contemptible. Let me refer you to another part of the Bill of Rights that is despised by the central government mentality of the status and their miscreant and malcontent supporters. And it involves private property rights under the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment. Nor shall a person be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Now you know why people plead the fifth. Nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Oh, and here's the part I want to focus in on. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Oh my good, did you hear that part? It's the last part of the Fifth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment is part of the Constitution. Now, I know we're supposed to reject all of this for the better good, the greater good, the public interest. That's what these central mindset masterminds keep telling us, right? And their supporters. But no, 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 no. This is the law of the land, whether they say so or not. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Hmm, that's very interesting. What about these myriad regulations that the unelected bureaucrats in what I call the fourth branch of government, the administrative state, when they issue them? What about those? What about when the Environmental Protection Agency destroys somebody's property rights because somebody spit on their lawn and they go, oh, look at that, it's a lake. And you know my point. What about the way they harass farmers and ranchers? What about the way they harass businesses who are trying to drill for gasoline and oil? So you're warm during the winter and you can be cool during the summer. What about all of them and all of that? Isn't that protected from the regulations out of the EPA and the Interior Department and the Agriculture Department and every other department and agency and division of a department and agency? Aren't they protected too? Well, the court has essentially said no. Well, how can that be? Is there no such thing as a regulatory taking of private property for public use without just compensation? Apparently not. So when the Environmental Protection Agency shuts down private coal mines, puts all those folks out of work, when they shut down the Interior Department drilling offshore, Destroying the value of property. When they shut down homeowners from building extensions on their homes. Or building homes at all on property property they bought 30 years ago. And wanted to put a small house on for maybe vacation or retirement. Who compensates those people? Who compensates those businesses? Nobody. Because apparently... When the framers at the ratifying conventions in the states adopted the Fifth Amendment, they meant to exclude all that stuff. No, they didn't. They meant to include every damn bit of it. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, you can't have a runaway federal government, a runaway administrative state, spitting out regulations left and right, a ubiquitous federal government, trying to remold you, trying to to control what you do, if the Constitution is actually enforced and upheld, including the Fifth Amendment, including that part of the Fifth Amendment at the very end, 
after the last comma, well, the second to last comma, nor shall private property be taken for public use, comma, without just compensation. There is no compensation. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. You have to hire a lawyer and fight for years and years against a federal government that is aggressive, that is stubborn, and has an uh, endless resource of money called your taxes. The Constitution. No wonder Thomas Friedman despises it. No wonder Richard Cohen, columnist, despises it. No wonder uh, Richard Stemple, at a Time magazine, who used to head the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, has no use for it. No no wonder uh, Professor fill-in-the-blank has nothing but contempt for it. No wonder the President of the United States evades it. No wonder the Democrat Party wants nothing to do with it. Because the Constitution stands between tyranny and our liberty. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. 